it's an exciting time to be on the planet right now to see the connections that are finally being made between the human gut microbiology and the soil microbiome and the planetary microbiome, you know, and I think a lot of those very early philosophers and thinkers that were saying this were treated like they were crazy, you know, that the, that the planet was a microbiome or um, what you ate made any difference in your health. Um, and so it's so fascinating to see this whole new frontier opening up. And so all the discoveries that we're seeing in terms of the gut microbiome, which is happening every single day, there's another paper that comes out, uh, is reflected in what we're discovering in the soil. Nicole Masters is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine, sponsored by the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. Nicole is an independent agricologist, pattern thinker, author, and educator. For over two decades, Nicole is recognized as a knowledgeable and dynamic speaker on the topic of soil health. Her experience has spanned diverse sectors from community gardens and horticulture to vermiculture, compost tea production, and diverse multi-species systems. Her company, Integrity Soils, delivers coaching and educational programs to producers and organizations spanning over 24 million acres. In 2021, Integrity Soils shifted away from in-person consultancy, the one-on-one -on -one aspect in some respects, focusing on training the next generation of coaches. Train the trainer. Let's get those people out there and doing the work. Her first self-published book titled For the Love of Soil, Strategies to Regenerate Food Production Systems showcases examples of the tools, principles, and mindset producers adopt to regenerate their soils. When the roads are good, you'll find her traveling in her Ford F-350 horse trailer in tow, working alongside producers to build soil and sink her carbon emissions. Nicole, <laughs> welcome Thank to the much. show. I'm so excited. I could just jump through the screen and give you a big hug. I'd love to give you a hug. You look very huggable there, Mark. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. Thanks. <laughs> I absolutely love your book. And, and so we're, uh, just to let my, my guests know, we're here to talk about the book. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to give it all away. We're not going to be the cliff notes of your book and your, your life's work. And you've spent a lot of time on it. You're doing even more writing. Um, for your first book, wow, you hit it out of the park. This is a beautiful read, wonderful stories. Um, every chapter, there's uh, something, not only the way you explain science, soil science, and the way you talk about our living world below our feet is beautiful, but the stories of those farmers and the people you've interacted with um, is, very, is very touching, and they're real. Uh, and so I really like it. I thank you so much for that. I thank you so much for that feedback. It was, it was a really um, challenging journey going through writing a book. I think everybody who's written a book appreciates that. Um, and everyone that's dreamed of writing a book appreciates the challenges. Uh, but I, I started writing in 2010 and I'd written about 30,000 words, which is around half of a book, third of a book. And it was saved on Dropbox and Dropbox deleted it. And <laughs> I had this like maybe three minutes of a little cry. And then I was like, well, that's done. You know, there was nothing, I, there was nothing I could do to get it back. And so it took me probably another seven or eight years to write this one. And I'm so, so grateful that I had that time to kind of get knocked off my horse and digest a little more because this book is, is, is not a technical soils for dummies. It's very much the, what are the stories of the people on the ground? What is it that they do? Who are they in this space? And I didn't want another reference book. And I went to multiple publishers, got turned down by four of them. Um, they said they wanted something more technical. They wanted me to take the personal voice out. And I'm, I'm like, I don't want to be a reference book that just sits on a shelf that no one really 
gets. So I went down the self-publishing route and it's been absolutely extraordinary. And I think in this day and age, you don't need publishers. You just, you don't. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I'm so glad you took that hard role. I, I know a little bit and I've heard the story a, a couple of times, um, you know, that they really wanted you to publish a, a, a soils book for dummies, you know, and and that's not your writing style. And that's absolutely true. I mean, if you, I just uh, ha had Elaine uh, Ingham on, on the podcast as well. If you look at her background, or if you look at most of her references, you know, there are a lot of academic science publications, books out there. And that's usually where they remain. They remain on the shelf. Not a lot of farmers, uh, a lot of farmers who have dyslexia, by the way, um, are out there with the book and an academic book. They're, they want to hear the stories. They want to get out into the fields. They want to touch the soil. And, and that's one thing that I love about you is, is you get out there and you do that. You get into the soils. You speak the same language they do. You drive the same vehicles they do. You're out there working <laughs> in the fields with them. You're out there just telling them who you are, bearing your soul, and um, telling them what you've learned and what, what is science and applying it to everyday practice in life. And so I love that. Uh, to back up just a tad bit, you're, you are a true global citizen. You're originally from New Zealand. I don't know where in New Zealand exactly. Yeah, my farm that I sold seven or seven years ago was in the Hawke's Bay. So if you look at the North Island of New Zealand, it looks like a stingray. And it's the right flap of the wing curves under and that's where the Hawke's Bay is so under there so summer dry country very can be very winter wet um yeah and and so it's been an extraordinary journey really I sold that property and had been living on the road ever since and I think that's part of what you hear through the book is the privilege of being able to live in other people's houses is you really get to see what's happening underneath that first surface of meeting someone you know people can be very polite they're not going to yell at their kids, you know. <laughs> they're going to say what they think you want to hear. And after a few days, people, they just bear their souls. They just, you know, they, they lay it out. And, um, you know, some of my most favorite people is that genuine, like this is such an honor and a privilege to be able to share in, in just a moment of your life. So, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm that's literally. Fabulous. I have family from road. Auckland, New Zealand and, and, um, so I, I, I love Auckland, New Zealand. I love New Zealand and uh, Australia. There's uh, a lot of great farming and great people in, in my book, Men You Be, that are, that are from there as well, who've, who've written contributions. There is a discussion right at the outset, and actually your, co your cover kind of teases it and guides, it, guides us into this, is um, you were kind of this barefoot... Uh, now, I wouldn't say hippie, but you just like to be in touch with the soil. And, and uh, you were walking pretty much everywhere barefoot and you were got some advice from some people that that might not be a good idea. And later you found out they, they weren't that wrong. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and how that kind of really turned on a light, not only to what you do, but also your connection to the soil and and, and what, what humanity does uh, can really affect us. Mm. Yes, and I, I think for a lot of New Zealanders, we, we were raised barefoot. I mean, barefoot is kind of normal in, in New Zealand, less so when I travel, you see, you don't see so much barefoot, but uh, we lived in Hong Kong for seven years and really not a place for bare feet. And when I was 15, I was walking along the side of the road. This is what, we, we guess happened and potentially had a cut on my foot and paraquat had just been applied, which is, um, it's a residual herbicide that there is actually no antidote for. So in third world countries, it's one of um, the most common causes of suicide it, it is you, you can drink paraquat, they can't get it out of your body, you're going to die. Really awful, awful way to die. But I ended up in hospital, they thought I had meningitis, did a lumbar puncture, my neck froze up um, and had just scorching migraines and headaches and foggy brain. And yeah, they, they were like, no, we don't know what's wrong with you. Go home. You're fine. You don't have meningitis. And so for the next 15 years, I had 
they thought my the vertebra C1, C2 were fused in my spine. Um, I had neck, massive like structural issues, like my muscles were so tight. And it was just like I had this foggy veil, which is interesting because I think how much more dangerous I would have been if I didn't have that. And because I was 15, people thought the behavior change was just normal teenage behavior. But actually it was, you know, a pretty serious poisoning. And it wasn't until I was 30 that I worked with an incredible um, detox specialist who identified paraquat. And we did hyperbaric chamber, intravenous vitamin C, and it came out my nose. Like it was this gray, black, it stank, it was disgusting. Um, and after that, it was literally like, it was like my life before and my life after that moment. And it's such a common story is people come up to me and they say, you know, I've sprayed paraquat my whole life and I'm fine. And I'm like, well, tell me about your children. Well, they'll have ADHD, childhood leukemia, learning disorders, all sorts of issues. And so what we're seeing is many of those early exposures um, affects the epigenetic pathways. So we see epigenetic responses in the next generation, which is terrifying and, and, and frightening for the people who are involved in spraying ag chemicals. But what for me, I think the conclusion from this whole process was, is that I didn't know that I was poisoned, but I spent my whole life looking at how do we get chemicals out of the food chain and out of the soil system and out of the waterways. So it's interesting how your subconscious knows. My, I didn't know, but yeah. That, that is, uh, I'm sorry you had to go through that, but uh, it's quite the, the learning lesson, I, I would say. And, and um, how integrate the biome of our earth, no matter where we're talking about, Hong Kong, New Zealand, uh, Germany, or the United States. And, and now you're in Montana, am I correct? That's right. Yeah, I call Montana home these days but I'm just about to get on the road again and probably be moving well moving down towards Idaho I'll be in my trailer so my my home is where my wheels are yeah well I'll be in Idaho very soon as well so I'll be uh, to the seventh Sun Valley form and um, catch them Idaho and then I have some property in Lava Ranch Idaho that I'll be up there too tending to my property uh, there as well so maybe our paths will cross. I'd love to see you. Uh, I, I know that you, and this is kind of going back to this global citizen. You're all over the place. So you, mm -hmm. you're very well versed. And, and the reason for that is that's, you go to where the farms are, to where the farmers are, to where the soil is, and uh, speak with those individuals on um, <clears throat> how to make this transition and this transformation, which can be sensitive, kind of a, a hard subject to address. And so in, in, in this podcast, I would like to, you know, we've already kind of started out a little bit deep in some respects, but I want to keep it a little simple in the beginning as we, we get on. Um, I find it extremely hard to do that because you've already, you've already, in, in my question, uh, told us about what you experienced in Hong Kong, which is uh, uh, something that they spray on crops and, and, um, and that, that you got as a child walking barefoot and, and it affected your life for quite some time. Mm -hmm. How can we get into a discussion now or as some questioning, how closely tied is the biome of our earth and what we do to that in our farming practices tied to the biome of our body and do a transition kind of into more depth and substance there? Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's an exciting time to be on the planet right now to see the connections that are finally being made between the human gut microbiology and the soil microbiome and the planetary microbiome, you know, and I think a lot of those very early philosophers and thinkers that were saying this were treated like they were crazy, you know, that the, that the planet was a microbiome or um, what you ate made any difference in your health. Um, and so it's so fascinating to see this whole new frontier opening up. And so all the discoveries that we're seeing in terms of the gut microbiome, which is happening every single day, there's another paper that comes out, uh, is reflected in what we're discovering in the soil. So that 
if you think of your own gut system for the plant, that plant's gut system is outside of its body. And so what we do internally, the plant's doing externally. So there's all of this communication with microbiology to get vitamins and enzymes and minerals and everything that that plant needs, water, all comes through that, that conduit. And by disrupting that soil microbiome, it disrupts the quality of the food that we're growing or we're, and then the food that we're ultimately eating. So what we see in the US is an epidemic of a hidden hunger in that people are not getting the trace elements and the vitamins and the secondary metabolites that they need to thrive and survive. So people eat more because they're looking for something, not even realizing what they're looking for. And uh, there's more and more connection on what they call the farm effect. So how you're raised, the animals that you're around, being able to play with soil as a child can actually set your microbiome up for life. So if you disrupt that early on, and I have a concern around what's happening with kids in the last couple of years out of COVID, you know, you've got masks on, you're in these highly sterilized environments. How has that undermined our natural microbiome that sets us up? Love that. I love that you give that connection. I don't know if you've uh, ever heard anything from Dr. Zach Bush or so that, uh, you know, we talk about the COVID and, and uh, around the Wuhan province, not only was it a high time for industrial agriculture, but a lot of cyanide poisoning from heavy industry up in the air mixed with that, what they were spraying on their soils. And then, um, that, that that biome was was very, very um, toxic, setting up some right conditions for our, our own biome and kind of how, how things spread uh, around the world. I also am concerned and wonder, you know, what did the COVID do to, to our, our health and our gut biome? When, when I talk about, uh, I'd give a lot of presentations. I talk about the um, bacteria tree of life. There's that one section that wasn't even really discovered and fully understood until 2015. And it's more the candida. It's some of the bacteria that they found in, in Yellowstone. You talk about that in your book as well, kind of uh, Yellowstone and some things. And, and we didn't even realize that existed until 2015. And this whole branch of the tree, uh, bacteria tree of life. And it's just more and more this connection of the biome and the biome of our bodies that um, uh, there's a, an interesting saying that human health or our individual health is a microcosmos of the world around us. And I'm th I, I think they're speaking about our, our soil health, our biome around us is really a big reflector of, of our own personal health. And so I would love to hear your, I mean, you say there's papers coming out constantly, but I'd love to hear your views and, and thoughts on, on that even more. Yeah, for me, it is just fascinating. Um, you know, in some aspects of soil, particularly, and I talk about this a lot, but it is really interesting, is how we can smell geosmin, which is the odor of the earth, which is released by some specific organisms. So there are an actinobacteria or actinomycetes. Uh, they release an antibiotic. We use about 200 of them to make different types of antibiotics in medical use. So they're long chain bacteria. They release a smell and that smell is like when you're driving on a hot summer's day and there's a shower of rain that hits the road. Like that smell is just, you know, we all I don't know anyone that doesn't like that smell. We can smell that smell at one part at 200,000 times the concentration that a shark can smell a drop of blood in an Olympic swimming pool. Like that's mind boggling. And we're keyed in to smell these organisms. We know the smell of healthy soil, no matter where you live or what your background, or if you've lived in a city your whole life, people still know what healthy soil smells like. And for me, it's because it's that return to the mother. It's the return to this is where we came from is, is soil and how much of you know, our DNA is viral, how much of our DNA and our cells are due to bacteria. And yet we're so arrogant to think that oh, well, you can take this probiotic and that's going to fix your problems. <laughs> or, you know, um, you, you just need to alter this one gene and it's going to make all the difference in, in terms of health, you know. And I guess right now we're at this 
precipice or a decision-making time that either we go down more technology and more engineering or ask the question of how does nature do this and how do we work within nature uh, because the solutions are already there. It's just once we start tinkering and think that we know better that we end up causing what we call the unintended consequences, which, you know, the book has a lot of examples of those. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the one that you gave is absolutely in the book and, and, and wonderful. And I, I do want to tickle a little bit even deeper that when uh, you have unhealthy soil, there's usually accompanying smells that come for there. And that you, yeah, I mean, I don't want you to touch on all of them because I'm sure there's many, but if you could just give us a few more examples of uh, of different types of smells and what that means when, when we're smelling those uh, uh in comparison to good compost or good composting tea that has a totally different smell, you know? Mm. And a totally different feeling as well. Like that smell, your vagus nerve that runs, you know, between the gut and the brain, 80% of those signals go from the gut to the brain. Like your gut is your primary brain. So breathing in um, and, you know, this, if you haven't been around a lot of compost, you just got to watch because there can be diseases in compost. So like legionnaires. <laughs> However, that smell of good compost, like it's got those ammoniacal, mushroomy kind of smells, uh, that rich, earthy, deep, like if you close your eyes, you can feel like you're in the forest, you know, that kind of moist, dense, oh, deliciousness. And then you compare that to, and you might have smelt this sometimes when you've been around a blocked drain. So when soils become anaerobic and they run out of oxygen, uh, plant roots aren't going to survive in there. Like this is our one of the main limitations to growth and health is that most soils are incredibly compacted. And when they get compacted and they lose oxygen, you get the anaerobes. So these bacteria that kick in and as they break organic compounds down, they release things like um, hydrogen sulfide. So you're going to smell farty smells there's some organisms that almost make a vomity kind of smell so if you're getting these sour putrid my drain's been blocked kind of smells in a soil then you're like okay it's got waterlogged it's got compacted the microbiology aren't functional for a healthy aerated ecosystem so there's smells that we are even if you're not a gardener you'll still recognize that and go, oh, I, I don't want to touch that. I certainly don't want to eat that. Um, I'm probably going to get sick. Yeah, vomity, metallic, almost kind of different. There, yeah, I, you know, obviously, the, yeah, I, I love how you talk about that in the book and weave that in so nicely uh, for those who are not very familiar with gardening or composting or, or uh, certain types of things and how those smells are not only more fine-tuned than like you say with a shark but also how they're they're tied to the basic elements of life to our biome which is tied to the earth we we crawled out of this primordial soup i mean micro uh, organisms and bacteria paved the way for us to come on to the the scene mm -hmm. onto the stage of this life and i i love that and there's um i i'm a big huge uh, fan or one of my best mentors in, in life is Lynn Margulis. I wish she was still here. She's a scientific revolution. But there's a, uh, a book that she wrote. It's a symbiosis as a source of evolutionary innovation. It's one of the most fastest growing and, and biggest innovations our world's ever seen. And that's something that you're talking about. That's something you deal with every day. So, sim uh, sim soil and symbiotic soil and this this you know not just mycorrhiza and fungi and bacteria but many things this this web food of life that is really playing huge roles and so um was there ever a time where you said wow lynn margulis where you got to know her and you 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 kind of learned about those things and you said oh for me, it was through uh, Fritz Hof Capra. He he teaches a course on systems view of life, and he kind of brought her to light for me. And I can, the I cannot shut the door ever again on the wisdom <laughs> I learned from from Lynn Margulis and how it ties to to exactly what you deal with in your work every single day. Well, I think it's fascinating, and in part, what I think we're seeing globally is this collective consciousness that we don't you don't necessarily need to 
read this book or hear this or meet this person that we're starting to become imbued with this knowing it like the poisoning was a knowing um for me so we're seeing these conversations pop up and it doesn't matter if you're involved in education or if you're involved in politics or health or soil or whatever it is that you're interested in we're seeing um this collective space opening up and it really it really came to the forefront for me a couple of weeks ago i was at the um boulder the colorado university conference called the conference on world affairs and you had speakers there from around the world you had speakers from who'd contributed to the the latest ipcc report um a lot of scientists a lot of teachers uh, there was a whole lot of um people involved in equity and justice and what was fascinating is it didn't matter where that person's background was if they were an academic if they were a young person they were all saying the same thing which is if we're going to address these big wicked complex issues that the planet's facing right now we need to connect with ourselves we need to be re-establishing our internal relationships and dealing with that wounded self and falling in love with who we are as individuals and transforming all of that past trauma um, before we can step out and say, all right, I'm going to create a just world or I'm going to create a world where climate change um, is addressed, you know, all, all of those pieces. And it was, it was absolutely fascinating to kind of look at the, the patterns that were showing up that is happening individually, even if you're in the middle of the Amazon forest or you're up in the Arctic circle, these, these thoughts are arising want to get into because you have this um I, I wouldn't say it's an acronym but you have this five m's of soil health basically and I, oh. I, I would love it if you can kind of uh, touch on those for us a little bit and explain why it's important to kind of use that as a uh, as marker and tools to kind of process uh the health of of, of your soils yeah, the five M's came about in terms of like training others to kind of see the world as I, the, the diagnostic tools that I use really. So when I'm working with producers, what is the triage of decision making? So we're not focused on the small part, we're focused on um, that whole picture as such. And so the five M's are, first of all, we're working with mindset, we're working with people. What is that part of the puzzle that's affecting the outcomes and the degradation or regeneration of a landscape? Then it's their management. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't matter if we're cropping or if you're in horticulture, um, ranching, what's happening with that management piece? And that's, that's the main part that's gonna make a big difference. Then we look at what's happening with microbiology, what's happening with minerals and, or mineral imbalances, and then what's the state of their organic matter which is um so technically it's an m but yeah we're cheating a little bit so through that um it gives us some decision making frameworks and also to think about it in terms of what is the main limiting aspect on any property is our ability to capture sunlight energy and you would think that that was a given but if you have bare soil um if you have spaces between plants if you are just growing a monocrop if um, those plants are nutritionally stressed, they will actually lower their ability to capture sunlight energy and we're losing all of that efficiency. So that sunlight piece is, okay, how do we make sure we're making the most of all of this free energy? And then we look at air, then we look at water, um, then we look at decomposition and nutrients. So the same, um, it's that Mas um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if anyone ever studied that. So looking at, what is it that a human being needs absolutely to survive? Well, without air, you're not going to last long, maybe three minutes. Without water, maybe three days. Without food, three weeks. It's the same in the soil. So we triage it very similarly, except that sunlight is the driving force for what's happening um, under the ground. So having to develop those frameworks was really helpful for a process that for many people can seem kind of esoteric. You know, I walk out on a piece of land and I can see geez, your water cycle's broken down, you've got all this compaction, you've got these animal health issues because you don't have this microbiology functioning. And that can be really overwhelming for somebody like, what, you know, how do you see all of those pieces? Um, and and it, it really is by bringing 
um, these different aspects together to start to diagnose what is happening um, on a property. And for sure, that starts with the mindset piece. It's really this uh, multiple facets of a complex system, which I, I love how you bring all those pieces and all those facets together and make it understandable how the living world works and that you can't just address one facet of that complex system in order to solve the problem. Same thing with my work at the United Nations it is the same same way in 2018, all international organizations, one of them, the, the United Nations, all switched to the systems view approach to life where to solve human suffering in our global grand challenges and even agriculture challenges, we need to take this systemic approach. And I love how the, the five ends envelop that and, and also the way your approach this hands on uh, down to earth approach bottom up is very uh, um, addressing all those fa facets. And, and um, in your book um, that resonates with me and I would, I know would resonate a lot with uh, a lot of my farmer friends and, and uh, people who are on this journey as well to kind of reconnect to the earth or, or see it with a different lens, a, a new perspective. You, you really talk about this, <laughs> And it's similar for me, or it connects for me because uh, for my personal body, but you talk about the soil. Is your soil constipated? Does it have diarrhea? Does it have an upset stomach? What's going on in there? And I absolutely love that because <laughs> that happens with us at the same time. And so not only is it, does it put it into perspective, uh, if, you, if you would maybe please us a little bit with 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 those analogies or those similarities and how you see that in the soil and, and measure that health and what some of the meanings you know if it's heavy in pee uh, or you know what whatever is going on there how how you see that and um was was that something that you learned when you went through all your training and academic that to, to describe the way I, I don't think they teach that. I think that's something that you figure out much later. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Yeah. No, no. It, it, and and this this is in part why we developed the coaching school that we have because you can't learn this right now in university. And the you know I talk about the mindset and the paradigms a lot in in the book too. And people are asking for us you know the community to define regenerative agriculture let's say and it's it's you can't define something when you're outside of a paradigm when you're moving through a paradigm shift as the world is right now and i strongly believe that you don't have the words and the language to define that because it hasn't happened yet it's like trying to define society now when we only had the horse you know, when we were back in the industrial era to try and say, what would the world look like and what would people be doing? How do you even define the era right now? Um, <clears throat> and so I think that's an important piece to, to um, pulling some of these layers back. And, and I guess to go back to your in initial point, just thinking about how do, we, how do we describe and reconnect people to something that really is the source of everything, which is soil. And so this book wasn't written just for farmers and ranchers, although they are my intended people to communicate with and they are who I'm communicating with, but anyone that eats food should be interested in how do we restore these functions? And then how does climate change relate to how we're treating landscapes? So everything right now from the soil side, we have these totally disabled systems. You know, 90% of rangeland in America is highly degraded. That's a problem, right? And that degradation then shows up. If you think of soil systems like our digestive system, here's the constipation. Here's soils that are being lost through um, that diarrhea process, which means they are no longer holding onto nutrients. Everything's just flushing into the rivers and the waterways or blowing as dust. And I think most people this year in the US have seen those dust storms, has seen um, the sediment showing up in waterways, like the, the impacts of poor soil management are all around us right now. You know, I flew into Denver a couple of weeks ago and it's just like, whoa, you could barely see Denver at all as you're coming down. Um, and so we're breathing that and, and that is also having an impact on 
respiratory systems and underlying human health. They now say over 90% of humans living on the planet no longer breathe uh, clean air. It's like, hello, people, anyone in there? Like, <laughs> are we waking up to what's happening around us? And the soil is very much just a reflection of our own inner landscapes. When, when you say the soil's constipated, what does that look like? What does constipated soil look like? What does a diarrhea soil look like? Mm -hmm. And what, so what, what, what does it tell you when you see that? So visually what we'll see with um, soils that are constipated, you imagine that for you, it's very uncomfortable, but things are moving very slowly. So in the soil, that means that we won't be seeing decomposition. You'll see the development of thatch layers, for instance, which is organic material that's just sitting on top or the organic material that is there kind of oxidizes. It goes gray and white instead of bright yellow and breaking down into the soil. We won't see a lot of um, the keystone species that tell us that the microbial population's flourishing. So then we can do a microbial test to take a look and say, oh yeah, yeah, we don't, we, we have these organisms in the soil, but the, their activity is very, very low. But visually what you'll see is um, there'll be a lack of diversity of the invertebrates. There'll be, um, there won't be a lot of, pollinator species there's not going to be that kind of hum you know when you're on a property that's really healthy they they hum right because there's all these different flying insects and 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 you know bees are the least of it really you've got all those native pollinators especially in this country um and even dung beetles you know dung beetles fly in and make a huge amount of noise like they sound like wasps even um so that that noise gives us an indication that those soils have slowed down like there's no turnover there's no release of nutrients and above ground we'll see probably a lot of bare soil we see surface crusting so we see soils that aren't allowing water to move in and a consequence of that is you're going to see flash floods and then drought and flash floods and then drought and we're seeing this right around the world right now and climate change is exacerbating it but actually the soils are totally dysfunctional um, and so people managing landscape no longer absorb and hold on to water, which means they're also not recharging the aquifers, which means they're affecting everybody downstream. Like land management is not an individual individual's responsibility. This is a social issue for everybody on the planet to be interested in and to be supportive of what producers are doing on the ground because they're the ones that can make the biggest difference right now. The um, want because I, I I truly believe that that's also part of it, and I and I want to ask you some questions leading into that. Just last May in Germany, we really experienced some some huge issues with floods. So we had some supercell storms, which are basically like uh, hundreds of thousand kilometers of clouds and and cloud moisture that just drops out of one spot you know like a bathtub and it overwhelms these cities and we had 1300 people missing lots of deaths and a lot of damage farming damage um <clears throat> the thing that it told me is, is, is uh, that i know enough to be dangerous about soils and what my practices are over six generations of farming come is that all those even though they were older German cities, infrastructures were all built upon degraded, dusty, non-mossy, uh, old farmland, basically, where the soils couldn't hold that moisture. And, the, and once we built all this concrete and cobblestone, whatever type of cities on top of it, then 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 that's uh was a big issue and the infrastructures haven't been kept up to speed how do we get the rainwater in how how can we get some hold how do we figure out some other things for the city aspect but that ties into other things now during the covid we see a pretty much mass exodus for a lot of people moving out to the country trying to start farming and things and in your book you say you wouldn't buy an expensive piece of property or acreage or hectares without checking the soil first and that health. 
with the whole principles of regenerative soils and with these practices, do we want to still check the soil and do that? Or do we want to say, well, if I can get a good deal or if I can do the soils, I'm going to restore it. I'm going to try to put some of these practices into place to turn it into the kind of farm and practices that I want. And it will be okay eventually. Or is it some places in our world that it's just too late? It's never going to happen. It's never going to get back. Oh, no, I, I don't think that's true at all. I think we can, we can regenerate every single landscape. It just takes the will, um, people with the financial backing to do that because on some of these landscapes, uh, it's going to take a while, right? These are incredibly degraded. So I just think for the average person, if you're looking at buying a property to dig a hole and at least go into it with open eyes and not have, hey, there's something lurking underneath the, the surface. So the farm that I brought, we um, discovered a significant um, hard pan concretion, basically. And I knew that it was going to be part of the fun. Like, let, let's see how quickly we can regenerate that. You know, in year four, I was questioning my sanity. And by year seven, that entire hard pan had been churned through worms and deep rooting plant systems and we'd built a huge amount of topsoil and it was you know this great feeling of we've overcome something that nobody else in the community could do um, and at the same time yeah that wasn't my main source of income you know for somebody that is actually having to live off a landscape um, how to do that you know maybe you could invest in bees or pigs or things that have a higher financial return and then invest what you can back into building infrastructure on the land but this is kind of why i say it's a social issue is we will spend billions of dollars cleaning up new orleans or new york city or you know the the end that where the, where all that water or that dust lands and the sediment or everything else or build walls or whatever you want to do and bridges instead of going actually, we should invest in the producers, we should invest this into building infrastructure at the source. So have the soil that functions like a sponge that will absorb, you know, 18 inches of rainfall in an hour, which is what some of these soils can do. And yet you see we have flash floods after two inches of rainfall, right, we have soils that are totally water repellent. How do we find systems to to restore and reward those producers that are doing an incredible job because the money's going somewhere, right? And right now it's all the reactionary, um, I don't know, mechanical approach and mechanical thinking to something that's a biological issue. That's uh, almost, um, 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 yeah, mechanic, mechanistic approach or a mitigation approach instead of adaptation or trying to put in some of these regenerative practices, uh, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> So you, you would say definitely we, you know, even though we should, before we jump into a new property or if we know, wow, that's pretty degraded, we should still kind of get an assessment of what the soil's like, uh, 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 drop a stick and, and um, check it out to see what you're dealing with. With that pan that you experienced on your property and you knew it's, it's taking you uh, seven years now to, to get it up to speed, what did you do? Did you rip it? And, and uh, what, what, what kind of, what kind of tools and things did you use to, to get that back? Yeah. And it's a good question because that's what everyone else was doing was ripping and um, with big, big tractors. And what they found was they could actually only drag one ripper through that um, hard pan. And then what happens is if you don't address what's causing that you know, to reseal up, it just seals up again. So um, yeah, we lived close to a racetrack and that's what they were doing on the track on a regular basis. And it, it wasn't addressing the issue. So we used um, adaptive grazing management as much as we could. We were also running a horse um, training and breaking business. So horses are very hard on land. Um, so we did a recovery program for horse management. So if we had horses grazing really hard, then we'd be after the horses came out, we would put biologicals on that, um, vermicast, because I'm a big fan of anything out of a worm's butt is pretty magical. Um, and maybe some trace elements if it was needed, a little bit of calcium if it was needed, um, and then diverse plant species that we would actually 
either feed through the cow's mineral, so putting seed out through minerals and allowing cows to germinate seeds or trampling it in with animal activity. Um, so yeah, really just using um, biologicals, addressing any major mineral imbalances. So when we think about the five M's, we already had the mindset, uh, it's the management piece. And we knew that um, in terms of horse management, they're really, really hard on ground. So we couldn't necessarily change the management with the horses, but we could change the recovery after the horses came out. Um, we addressed our microbial imbalances. So we had a lot of bacteria in there, very low predators. So low protozoa, low nematodes. So we are using products that we were making on the, on the property ourselves. So like a wood chip inoculant um, and vermicast and compost that we're applying to the ground to address some of those microbial imbalances. Then any mineral imbalances, we're applying minerals. And then the organic matter piece is part of compost. So that's the five M's. So by, by applying those five M's to that property, we, we were able to break through that hard pan. And it was amazing to see, like in about year four, you could dig holes and you could see how all these huge earthworms were starting to work through what was a calcium silicate loose. So it's, um, you can buy calcium silicate to add to concrete to quick set concrete. Like that's, it literally was a concretion layer. Uh, now I, I used to work for OSHA and Occupational Health and Safety Administration of the US and, and teach uh, uh, different train the trainer courses. So I won't, I won't tell them that I've seen several pictures of you in some trenches Oh, checking yes. out the so uh, checking out the soil but uh, no i'm just easy so basically you you get down down and deep in a lot of situations i've seen you in several pretty pretty deep uh looking at the soil the different of uh, difference of topsoil how far it goes down in your book you talk about you know the uh, uh bears uh, kind of a bear cave area hopefully thank goodness the bears weren't there but how deep i think it was you said something like 25 feet or even more yeah. you know, we can see good topsoil and things some some healthy things going on pretty far down um yeah. when when you're when you're you're doing that around the world and you know especially probably right now united states north america um and you're getting down in these trenches is the hope to to um increase the depth of topsoil on existing farms and are most of those farms making this transition to out of industrial ag into more regenerative or biodynamic practices to really um in increase their long-term regenerative process so that they're that, that the the fao um of 60 harvests left that they said in 2015 is now only i think 40 or 41 harvests left uh, uh the last i checked i want to kind of know that process and what 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 pathway are we going on are this is a transition i'm sure for each one it's different but what are kind of the things that you're teaching coaching preaching and trying to get these new coaches on board uh, of what, what we want to do for long-term success in, in food and agriculture. Yeah, I find that the soil trench can be such a powerful connecting tool because you can get at eye level with, with soil. And what I find is some of the best producers, graziers in the world have never dug holes unless they're putting in a fence. They really are not connected at all with what's happening below the ground and um, with more and more interest in ecosystem services and greenhouse gas mitigation and, you know, carbon drawdown, soil is, you know, one of the largest terrestrial reservoirs, obviously. Um, and so being able to kind of connect people with, you know, for, uh, below that four inch depth, typically the carbon that's down there is like over 500 years old, 500 to 2000 years old. And it's being dropped down there through the exudates of plant roots. So you can visually see that and, and you can see how, you know, that carbon, those plant roots, the microbiology are all functioning down there in a, in a system that's working well. However, most ranches I go to are only, their topsoil might be half an inch, their rooting systems might be half an inch. I tell them you're half an inch from a drought, really. 
when you think about what these perennial grassland systems look like when the colonials first arrived, they talk about, you know, ripping up areas in Nebraska and Ohio with the plow. Those roots were like 20, 30 feet deep. They were dense. And the sound of that plow coming through those root systems sounded like someone cracking a bullwhip from a mile away. We don't have any of those systems functioning anymore. So for me, it's a way to connect people with what could be possible and how far perhaps are we from that, but that we could restore these ecosystems and, and really be pumping a lot of those greenhouse gases down into the soil back where they belong. Um, that's 60 harvest left. I don't think there's any data to back that up. That's one of those sensational kind of comments that people like to make. We will continue, just, <laughs> just depends what it looks like, but soil's not gonna run out. Right, and we can build soil very, very quickly. We have had operations where we've built an inch of topsoil, um, about we were building a millimeter a month. So, you know, in nearly two years, we built an inch of topsoil. So it is possible to, to build soil far, far faster than what academia thinks possible. That, yeah. that, I agree with you on, on, the, on the data as well. It comes from several different sources. So it's also, um, I, I've been speaking about this for a long time, but in, when they originally said it in 2015, it was based on several things. Back in 2015, we were losing um, 23 hectares a minute of, of, of land due to deforestation, soil degradation, contamination, deforestation, drought, and, and uh, flooding. Um, and, and that's since gone up. I think today's date is 29 hectares a minute. And so that's part of the data that they're using. And it's based on that global replicable hectare that we have. And um, so it, it's constantly fluctuating. And I I don't think our regeneration or restoration projects around the world are going fast enough to, to increase it, but hopefully it's keeping it at a, at a bay in some respects. Um, that leads nicely into to a couple points. You, you know, we, we see this in the US, this new regenerative organic standard coming about. We see a lot of talk about regeneration and regenerative agriculture. And I kind of want to know your thoughts and feelings and and can we do it? Can we make that transition, uh, help industrial ag farmers and the new youth and, and uh, gen next generation of, uh, of youth from those families and those farmers who are there, that they want to pass that on to their children and that there's hope that there's training, support, education and things out there. And I know that's one thing that you do, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you're big enough to handle the whole world. <laughs> No, and that, that was part of the this coaching training school was the, the impact of right now we have a bottleneck in terms of, you know, the industrial farming model is coming to an end. Um, we cannot continue to farm or live in this chemical soup that we've created, you know, and talking to a lot. I mean, I do talk to a lot of conventional groups and I'm careful with my language, obviously, but um, they are confronting huge amounts of pressure from, from so many different directions. And it's no longer viable and it's certainly no longer fun. You know, you talk about the amount of stress, the debt, the overwhelm, what's gonna happen with the climate. You know, it's, it's not a fun space to be in. And what regenerative agriculture brings is all that creativity and all the fun. And so we see a lot of young people coming in who are so lit up and so inspired, but part of, um, what we wanted to see with the coaching school is there is no way one person's going to, you know, going to turn the ship around. This does take the collective. And so the 20 students that just graduated two days ago, the impact that they potentially could be having on the world, or even, you know, I think of some of the calculations we've done on some of the ranches I work with one ranching family in Idaho, Older Spring Ranch, they are sequestering the greenhouse gas emissions of 18,000 people, just that one ranch, wow. right? So our potential to do things um, is enormous. It, it just takes that the confidence, it takes having someone perhaps to mentor and work, walk alongside a conventional producer, especially really high input industrial model ag. <clears throat> 
is how do we do this in a way that is not going to endanger the profitability because people are really up against the wall. I mean, farmers are not making money. It is not a viable business to be in unless you are doing this regeneratively. So some great studies and multiple studies now coming out to show that on average, regenerative agriculture is about 78% more profitable than the industrial model. You know, and Jonathan Lundgren's done some of that work, but there's many scientists involved in that. Um, and so I think that's a part of the puzzle, but finances alone isn't enough to really shift behavior. It is about having, um, yeah, having that partner really to walk walk alongside. And that's why we developed the coaching program. I love that. And I, I mean, also what you mentioned before is that uh, um, you're doing this, you do a bunch of different courses or you have in the past and you're kind of con continually uh, growing, learning, expanding, more train the trainer, more coaching the coaches and, and getting, you know, to, to reach that critical mass. But I mean, there's some some wisdom from uh, holistic land management, Alan Savory. He's also in, in my book. The, the problems and the issues with a lot of his work is that they weren't scientifically peer reviewed or backed up with, with things in, in a lot of respects. And now, um, more so they are and others are kind of coming into that space but uh all the work you've done is really it's proof from the pudding so to say real hands-on groundwork grabbing the soil teaching the people you've got this course coming up it's coming up um and actually the application for the course closes uh, may 15th and it's uh, a soil coach program called create is create an acronym for something or is it um it is indeed and it's a mouthful so it's consciously regenerating ecosystems in agriculture through transformative experiences wow uh so yeah it is a mouthful so we just talk create um and it has amazed me the people that applied for the first program you know some of the best producers in the country and also in in Canada, um, you know we had a we had a turf guy, Randy Booker, who's been running a golf course regeneratively for ten years. You know, using biologicals, and he's able to demonstrate he could cut his inputs in half. He could um, cut his mowing in half and his labor in half just through building soil health. And so, having someone like that on the program has been fantastic. And I'm learning, well, well, they're learning in terms of let's bring all of these different aspects that, um, you know, bring in the technical aspects, microbiology and minerals, um, bring in the management piece and, and bring in the coaching piece. Because what I found is we were looking to hire people and just not really able to find the caliber that I need that I demand. <laughs> and so I'm like, let's just train, let's just train people and not feel like I have to hire or control or have any of those old paradigms of scarcity and competition and threat. Like, let's just give it all away. So we've given away all of our coaching protocols, all of our business plans, all of our everything. That, so these coaches that come into this program have everything that they need to actually set themselves up in business, um, everything that they need to address their own internal um, struggles around might be finances, it might be around success, it might be around confidence, like the program really looks at what are all the different parts that create a successful business or a successful entrepreneur um, and and they had their own coach for the 18 weeks. So they've got someone they can actually work with to work through some of these big challenging issues. You know, I'm not good enough. Um, I don't know enough. And it's like, you don't, you don't need to know everything. We're not here to be the expert with the answer because that's the old paradigm. We need to be able to ask better questions. We need to be able to walk alongside people without having our own internal stuff come up, you know, how to work with someone without judgment and assumptions, you know, big, big, big topics. And I've just been blown away um, by how people really embrace this. Like this is exactly what the world needs right now. Complex, adaptive thinkers who, yeah, just incredible people. I love that. Yeah, uh, a, a, a true 18 week program designed to train, empower consultants, coaches, not just in the theory, but the hands on principles and practices behind 
healthy, regenerative agriculture systems. Um, I absolutely love it. So um, I'm going to be in the U.S. during that time. I think I might need to come by and partake of that. So I'm actually, <laughs> yeah, I'm on a, I'm on an eight country speaking tour. And so I'll be there and I have a little downtime during that period. So I would absolutely love that. Um, you would. I it's a big to, commitment. It's like yeah. probably we say 20 to 24 hours a week. Like it's a it's a part time job. It's a like, job. It's, it, well, yeah, if you want to do this, you want to do it right. So I, I agree. Uh, the reason I, I really wanted to, you to touch upon it and thank you for explaining the acronym and going into more is uh, the application deadline closes May 15th. I want people to through our podcast, we're going to put the podcast out. Um, and I want people to apply and really get in there and, and um, who are interested. I have a lot of people who are interested um, and hopefully it's all, the U.S. only. So um, we'll get just make sure they get in there and get committed. Yeah, in there, right. U.S. only for this year. Next year, it won't be offered in the U.S. We're going to go to Australia in the following year, probably Europe. So those that missed the U.S., deadline this year you're gonna to have to wait a few years unfortunately we have had quite a few people from europe applying for this one um and i wasn't quite sure how that would work because uh, you have to be in person twice at the beginning and at the end of the course but what's exciting about those people is if they can come in learn um the whole diagnostic process the coaching process then they potentially could be coaches on future courses and that's the expansion model is that I don't want to have to be the one. It's like, no, we, we want to lift and empower people so that they too can be driving a program like this, which I'm really excited about. Beautiful. Um, I know that you were on uh, Elaine Ingram's uh, Soil Regen Summit as well just recently. It was, I don't even think it was a month ago. Um, and beautiful presentation, beautiful talks there. And, and um, more and more awareness is just going through of, of people who, who want to do this, but you and her and many others, uh, Matthew, and, and um, there are really talking to farmers about, hey, do you have a refractometer? Do you have a microscope? Are you taking soil samples? Are you sending your soil samples out somewhere else at the very least to someone else? Um, and so what I like is you also, talk about the tools you talk about how to use them properly you also talk about where to go for help and it's a total support structure not only in your book but also in in everything that you do um, to empower those individuals those farmers those people who and, and uh, I'm sure and you you could tell me more in the past there's even been quite a few gardeners or permaculturists or people come in who don't have this vision of grandeur of hectares worth of land, um, but who who want to do it right? And um, I've seen some some miracles happen around less than a hectare where people have done some of these practices and just have produced enormous amount of results on a small piece of property because it's like a it's a food forest that turns into this jungle of of opportunities of what can be planted. And so. Um, I don't know if you want to go into a little bit more of, of why you choose to teach people those tools and uh, why it's important to to refract your 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 leaves and, and find out what's going there and to test your soil and get looking under the microscope. Why those are tools that we kind of have overlooked in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, again, it comes down to context, you know, for many uses, they're so busy that we need rapid assessments we need um, to be able to do potentially some of this monitoring without it being really cumbersome or overwhelming. Uh, so with that in mind, we developed the Regen platform, which is a online app that are, that are developed with Soil Mentor um, and Vita Cycle in the UK. But what's cool about it is um, it has 10 indicators that can be done pretty quickly and you can compare yourself to others in your same biome and on your same soil type and get that instant feedback because I think a lot of people have data for data's sake. They might have 
some chemical soil tests if we're lucky. Um, they might have some biology tests. Most people I find are not, they haven't spent the hours, you know, if you've got your 10,000 hours really on a microscope to adequately be able to assess, you know, is that healthy or is that dysfunction? Um, and so, yeah, people can spend a fortune kind of chasing different rabbit holes where I kind of like, what are some of these indicators? And a refractometer is probably a simple one just to measure, you know, sap bricks, but being able to observe, being able to smell, be able to look at color, be able to um, smell that soil, dig profiles, and just have a really rapid feedback that's like, okay, well, yep, we're heading in the right direction. I just showed um, a client a photograph of, a soil we we we've been we did some work on in 2018 and went back and took a photograph of that soil now and it is unrecognizable and I think he hadn't realized just the impact of all of this work that he's doing that you're starting to really see that on a large scale and for me I think I, I predominantly am interested in the larger producers because they they are the ones that are influencing climate they are the ones influencing the water cycle and the amount of chemicals in the environment uh but that's not to say that all of this can't be translated to a small scale right and that small scale you could be feeding hundreds of people on a hectare and i think that was the cool thing to see come out of COVID is people realizing how broken the current food systems and structures are and why are we not growing food in the local community you know I work with the Intertribal Agriculture Council um, who work with all the 574, 574 federally recognized tribes around the U.S. and when COVID hit they had no food um, and realizing that all the beef or the bison or the food that was produced on the reservations was being sent out of the reservations and suddenly there's no food so realizing hey we could we could be providing food in our own communities and i got a beautiful message recently from a school in london and they were growing their own making their own sourdough bread from their own wheat they were building soil they were um, had like a little restaurant and food for the parents and educating students around that soil function and the importance of livestock. And I'm like, and you're in the middle of London, you know? So I think there's so much opportunity. And right now it's people just sharing their stories on whatever scale you are. That could be the light bulb that someone else needs to just start growing some broccoli seedlings on their windowsill. It doesn't matter what that scale is. Like, how do we start to reconnect to nutrition and to food and how simple it is to actually grow a lot of these plants for yourself? I want to talk about uh, IMOs, indigenous microorganisms. So basically, oh, yeah. as Korean natural farming kind of practices and stuff, everywhere mm -hmm. we go is you work globally, you work in many different areas. Um, and there, there, there is, and you talk about it in the book a little bit that, you know, going back to the, the way it used to be decades ago, or uh, uh, might not always be viable because we've destructed, it might be gone. Um, but isn't it always better to not only check the soil before you start and get going and find out what you're working with, but also find out what those local indigenous microorganisms should be or are or could be in the area where you're farming or you're doing this and then um, to build those back up in your restoration and your regenerative processes and what kind of tips or tricks or things have you dealt with that that kind of deal with um, in that restoration process mm -hmm. i think we know so little about all of it we just know so little. And I think this is where don't be buying in biological single organism inputs from India, which is where a lot of these are coming from. I like the IMO. Um, I like natural Korean farming. I like vermiculture and compost in terms of let's foster that indigenous community that's already here. Go and find an area of forest that's really, really healthy and get some of that leaf duff. Um, if you've got a grassland that's really performing well, take some of the soil from those areas and incorporate that into your compost. Um, 
we use compost slurries. I'm not a big fan of compost teas at all. But I think this idea of like, we think that we understand a lot of, you know, a lot of the microbiology, you know, there's DNA and PCR, um, not PCR, NLFA, PLFA type testing now for microbiology. And what they find is a microbial test. They did one in New Zealand and they tested from one side of the South Island to the other. They did six different samples across um, cropland to forest to tussock grasslands to swamps. And what they found was 95% uh, of those microbes were the same. And uh, a scientist actually came to an event and tried to undermine what I was saying about building biology because he's like, hey, the biology is all the same. Luckily, there was a scientist that was kind of on my side and he said, well, that 5% that you don't know what they're doing must be really, really important for them to drive that much difference across. And so just saying something's present or absent doesn't necessarily determine how healthy an ecosystem is, right? And it's the plant that's feeding the microbiology and dictating what kind of microbiology are going to flourish, um, that resident population, the biomass has all been driven by that plant microbial relationship. So generally what we find is it's not a lack of specific organisms, it's that the environment and the foods are not there to support them. Uh, there is microbiology in the jet stream, right? There's spores being spread right across the planet, um, <clears throat> just coming in the air. So there is a microbial population out there. It's just, what are the conditions that I'm creating through my management and plant health and sometimes it does require some mineral nutrition and I've had producers say well I'm doing this great grazing management my soil should be really really healthy and after 30 years finding even with adequate rest that those soils are still not the same soils that they were um, pre-colonization and the reason for that is we have lost 30 to 60 percent of our carbon probably 30 to 60 percent of our nu nutrients and often we've lost a lot of really key important trace elements um, sodium, so certain elements have been lost out of that soil environment. So what we find is we might do a single input. And I'm just saying once, it might be something that we do put some trace elements on to support that plant so that it can now feed microbiology. And also there's stuff going on with plant breeding now so that many plant species no longer communicate with the microbiology. So wheat no longer signals to protozoa or fungi and so we've got these very um, insipid wheat plants that no longer have zinc. They no longer have secondary metabolites. They are totally dysfunctional, but they do well with you know phosphate fertilizers and all the rest of it. But that plant breeding has a big say in terms of what is the biological community. So really looking at native seeds, if you are using seeds, um, plants that are fit to your context, and, and yeah, making those kind of decisions. So again, that's where the 5M part comes in is it's not just microbiology that's creating a healthy ecosystem. Uh, I, I wanna go a little dip, bit deeper if you don't mind. You, you, you've said this before in uh, other podcasts or other uh, things, you also a little tickle a little bit in the book. Why, why the difference between uh, flurry and, and uh, tea? Uh, Tea compost tea. Um, what what what's your what's your thinking and why are you kind of not a big fan or, or or can you explain that to us a little more? I just feel unless you're really good on a microscope, most people don't know what they're looking at. I've seen a lot of people applying disease organisms. And they're like, oh, look at all that activity. I'm like, yeah, those are anaerobic bacteria, and you just <laughs> sprayed that all over your place. Um, when you're brewing, you're, there's organisms that are gonna respond more rapidly to the brewing process than others. Um, you're kind of trying to second guess what it is that the plant actually needs. And, and you know, so a brew, so a compost tea brew, you might be bubbling that away for like six hours or three days. Different organisms are gonna come and go and flourish through that process, but it depends on what foods you're giving them, right? So if you put a little bit of molasses or a bit of seaweed or humic acid, it's gonna feed different organisms. And then again, depends on the compost that you're using. So I would prefer to use a slurry um, whereby you, you test your compost, you know that your compost or your vermicast is really, really good quality. And we put it out at a higher rate. So as a 
you know, a compost, like a compost tea, you might only have a couple of handfuls of compost actually literally going out on a hectare. Um, we, or an acre, let's say, we might be using 30 pounds of compost per acre to get um, to get the effect. And when you're putting a slurry out, you know, it might be up to half or a fifth of an inch in size and material. And it's got all the compost in it. We put, might put some minerals in it. We can still put the food in it, but you don't have to brew it. And when you're working on a large scale to have to wait for a brew or have to get your timing just right, you got to apply it now and you're on a large scale, compost teas just don't fit. And I used to do it commercially and we would try and get things on in time and it was just it was it's it was too hard and I think if you're a small producer and you're good with a microscope then yeah use use the compost extracts um or compost teas but for us slurries just make so much more sense and it gives the microbiology something as well like a substrate to live in so you're just kind of sending it out with a home and then there's less um, consideration around having to get something to stick to a leaf or protect it from UV light. Um, and the other benefit from it is um, it's not just the living microbes that we're dealing with, it's all the secondary metabolites. So I'm not as concerned like, uh, is the biology living? It's those metabolites. So every single cell wall has like 100,000 receptors waiting for some kind of signal. And it's the signal that they'll get from those extracts that is in parts per trillion, that's enough to either get a biological community to respond or get a seed to germinate. And this is what we're seeing is that very, very low rates, we are seeing native seed banks germinate and respond to the application of extracts on large extensive grassland. And that has been just an aha phenomenal moment. That's beautiful. I only have four questions left for you and then we'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a workout today. I really appreciate you bearing with me. I want to talk about natural capital or total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA. How do we get that natural capital, that true cost back into farming that we take farming where the products that we produce through farming out of the commodity system? Because I think most of these transitions to regenerative are eventually stepping away from that model because it's a model that locks you into something that is a no win model mm -hmm. in my opinion, yep. but I want to get your thoughts and feelings and how, yeah, I mean, I know you're capturing the carbon. You're also, also talking about, you know, what, what the, you, you mentioned earlier, how much the <clears throat> farm was capturing carbon enough for so many people, which is amazing. But well, what else are you doing on the true cost and the natural capital? Yeah, and I think this is where full life cycle analysis needs to be included with everything that we buy. If that's a, a refrigerator or a solar panel or a crop, what, what, are the, what are the costs that aren't being revealed? And it might be even in the equity or justice component as well. Who grew that and in what? you know, conditions where they're growing that. But the commodity markets and the industrial model has really set up structures for land degradation. And until those structures are addressed, then land degradation is going to continue because that model's not set up for it, which is uh, low cost monocultures, um, large scale and producers being very isolated and um, not being remunerated for the product that they're growing anyway. Uh, and so I do think the natural or ecosystem services, I mean, you could call them life support services, is part of what needs to be acknowledged and appreciated for, you know, farmers and ranchers are the greatest area of conservation on the planet. They are the, the water source and the greenhouse gas sink. And, and that whole part is how do we start to do this in a way that doesn't put ecosystem services on the commodity market? Because for me, that's the death knell of what, it's the, it's the antithesis of what we're, we're talking about, which is how, how do we really reward people for doing the good work that they're doing for the whole planet? Um, and that's a tricky one, right? Because subsidies, even right now, subsidies are set up for degradation. How do we shift some of those subsidies towards uh, more of a green bond or acknowledging 
um, ground cover or acknowledging um, allowing land to be fallow for a year or two if you're in a cropping situation. Sure, it's not going to make you money immediately, but you're building that soil resource is let's get really interested and engaged with how do we start to reboot these entire systems because the consequence of not doing that is the end of humans living on this planet. Like, let's not mess about with this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, when, when you're talking earlier, uh, I really thought of Alan Savory about resting the ground and, and, and that even Alan has said many times, a lot of conservation projects, natural parks or things like that, they've seen that it hasn't increased the microbial health, the soil health over time by just not having any any movement, blocking it off, conserving it, that... that um, it's actually better that we we get a little bit of, of compost and movement and uh, herds and, and things going through there so that we have have uh, the whole, the soil restoring and regenerating and doing its mm -hmm. natural cycles in some respect than, than it is to just leave them and um, the the last yeah. three questions I, I really have and you can address that if if, if you want to I just was thinking about well, it because we spoke about it as well. Important consideration to just weigh up is where is land being conserved? Who is conserving it? What is really happening with the, the land function in that, you know, taking livestock off if there's no wildlife to replace it or there's no wildlife with apex predators, which we're seeing some people trying to put bison back without a predator. But really they're land grabs, right? It's it's ways to take land off indigenous people. It's just the colonize, it's just another form of colonization. And we need to address mm -hmm. that. And there's a huge amount of land in this country that I believe if we could work together to really look at restoring land function should be returned to indigenous people. Absolutely. I'm gonna get hate my now. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely not. No, you won't. Um this is the hardest question I have for you today, and uh, I really want your answer, not what you think other people want to say. And I don't have to worry about that with you, I believe. What, <laughs> what, what, yeah. What, yeah. <laughs> what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? What it looks like is people really addressing their wounded selves. So they're not operating out of greed. I mean, we are seeing the consequences of the capitalist model right now. You know, you're seeing wars in areas that are being driven by, oh, well, someone needs something in the US. <laughs> you know, we're seeing wars over phosphate in Morocco. You know, there's kind of ridiculousness and, and people below the poverty line while there's oil coming out while there's, you know, mined resources coming out. There is enough food on, in, on this planet for, for probably two population full, you know, that, that wastage, that greed, that consumerism, so much of that comes back to people that are deeply wounded and, and people that have not dealt with their own trauma. And so for me, a world that works is that people, can they regenerate themselves? Can they love themselves? Can they, truly have empathy for people around them and then some of the things that we do if we could see what was that full life cycle analysis for this material to get into my hands would go I cannot have this telephone <laughs> because <laughs> there were children that suffered along the way to do this but and do I really need a new phone every year for instance but I think the more that we start to peel back some of that hidden and some of that consumer drive and you know, fear, especially fear in this country, is a huge motivational factor to to get people to feel like they don't have enough or that they got to protect themselves or whew, we better, you know, go and shop at these big box stores so that we can top our, our hearts up. And it's like that none of that tops your heart up. So uh, I think reconnecting with nature, um, we don't have to be putting the stress on the environment that we currently are. It's It's all just greed and, and overconsumption. So yeah, that, that's what I feel like a world that works. Beautiful. If there was one message that you could depart to my listeners that 
was a sustainable takeaway that really has the power to change their life, what would it be? And even if it's two messages. <laughs> no pressure, Mark. Um, <laughs> um, dig a hole and sniff that soil, breathe it in, get some microbes in your, in your gut, get them in your lungs. Um, and connect with where your food's coming from. Get curious if that's a farmer's market, if there's a local community garden, um, if you are sourcing from further away. There's some beautiful, amazing ranches out here that are distributing meat around the country. Connect with them, get to know who these people are as people and get to know how your food was growing, you know, is, um, how humane that is. You know, even if it's just once a year, go take the kids, get in the car, go and visit some of these food producers and just realize how hard they're working and how much they care and how much they care about you, the people that are eating food. So yeah, that would be my message. Oh, I love it. What have you experienced or learned in this big long journey as a global citizen so far that you would have loved to know from the beginning, from the start? Er most people always say hey mark it's the journey i i don't think there's anything i've just enjoyed the learning and the journey that's what i had to and uh the other yeah. thing that i say is i always wish i would have started sooner much sooner i wish i would have came to that realization much sooner i would be much further along um trust your gut I think, and doing IgG, IgA blood tests for major um, allergies. I wish I'd done that earlier because a lot of that contributed to the just function of my brain and my ability to achieve what I wanted to achieve um, was being limited by food allergies as well. So I, you know, I feel like it's all been a journey for a reason, but I would really have liked to have seen that earlier and someone had told me about that IgG test in 2005 and I didn't get it done until 2015 and man that what a difference that would have made but you know that's that thing I don't live in regret it's like ha but, uh, having the veil lifted yeah I know exactly yeah. is that is that test similar to like a blood culture or is it different than a uh, blood culture no it's looking for your Im immunoglobulin so okay. your what are you chronically allergic to and what are you acutely allergic to so it picks up those two different markers in the blood but yeah it's a test that i want to make available to <laughs> everyone in my family because you see uh you see major because we have a gut disruption and everyone's got broken gut microbiome most people have allergies now that they wouldn't have had the previous generations, you know, like your parents didn't necessarily have those allergies, but if we can restore that gut function, it's going to definitely help. But, it, you know, we've got so much chemical exposure now, it's hard to have an intact microbiome. For the love of soil strategies to regenerate our food production system. I love this <laughs> book. I, I, I think you're fabulous, Nicole. Nicole Masters, thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. Uh, um, and when I'm in the States, I hope that I can swing by and come and bug you uh, or say hi. Um, I hope our paths cross many times in the future. And thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate all that you do. You're you are the, the true evangelist and hands-on practitioner changing our world. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Mark. It's been such an honor to, to connect with you. Thanks, everybody. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>